I am going to call government services uh, committee meeting to order. This meeting is being recorded and will be part of our minutes that will be on our website if you need to refer constituents to it. All right. So the first thing that we have on our agenda is public comment, which we do not have any public comment. But we will ask our youth and governance representative to go ahead and read uh, the statement of the youth and governance. Hello, I am a member of the Racine County Youth and Governance Program, and I will be participating in tonight's meeting. This program serves to empower youth in Racine County by encouraging me to participate in local government. I have agreed to abide by the applicable standards of conduct that would govern any elected county board member. While I am encouraged to participate and am allowed to have a non-binding advisory vote on matters before the committee, all formal action taken by this committee will be based solely on the binding vote made by county board, board supervisors. Thank you so much. So this is our first meeting of the government services with our new committee and also our new youth and governance representatives. Uh, so welcome. If you do have any questions, please know that this is structured very relaxed and just uh, feel free to uh, just acknowledge that question. Uh, we do have an actionable item on the agenda right now, and this is the approval of the minutes from the previous meetings. I think I will just ask those who have served on this committee to go ahead and be the ones to make this motion on this one, just because you have reviewed the minutes from the meeting you were part of. Move to approve. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I will call the question first by the Youth and Governance representative. How do you wish to vote? Is it aye or no? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> All right, <laughs> committee, how do you wish to vote? Aye. aye. Is there any nays? Hearing none. It is passed. All right, so new business. Uh, we have asked the county treasurer to do a uh, give us a rundown of what's going on in uh, the county treasurer's office. Uh, just for those who are new, we oversee the constitutional departments and that is the, one of them is the county treasurer's uh, department. Come on in, <laughs> please. I'm so sorry. No, please don't, no, you're right up here. No need to apologize. This is our second youth and governance representative. I forgot to set my own. Oh, goodness. Oh, yeah, no worries. No worries. Yep. We are just about to get the presentation. It's under new business on the agenda from our county treasurer, Jeff. Please. Thank you. I'm excited to be the first to be able to present to the new board. Uh, congratulations on that new position. My name is Jeff Latis. I'm the county treasurer. I've been county treasurer since October of 2019. I was planning <coughs> to take the last year term of my predecessor and then ran for re-election in 2020, and I'm about halfway through my term right now. Uh, I'll be up for re-election in 2024. So I'm happy to kind of tailor this to any specific questions that anybody might have, otherwise I've got about you know, just a five minute presentation and I'm happy to field questions at the end. All right, yeah, please go through your presentation and I think what might be really vital to this, uh, to this body is really talking about what they're seeing that come before the county board and but maybe you'll address it in here but we'll that up. absolutely okay. so um the county treasurer's office was located down in the courthouse on the first floor first and foremost i really view my office as a resource for the community um, you know, certainly we've got a lot, we wear a lot of different hats in the county treasurer's office tax collection among many uh, you know banker but I first and foremost view myself as a resource for the community. One of the first things I did when I took office is really kind of took a step back and saw what was out there for community resources and put together the flyer that you see here. This is a handout that we've got available in our office. We have additional handouts available as well. Uh, but this was one that we put together and went through a pretty extensive vetting process. And one of the things I wanted to avoid is sending people who needed resources to potential contacts that weren't going to be able to service them or that it was a challenge for them to work through. So with many of the resources that you see in here, I actually invited them down to my office and we went through an interview process and I really 
trying to do each. If I am a constituent reaching out for resources, what's my experience going to be like? So, uh, you know, I'm confident and comfortable. This is a living document that is ever changing. And when I encounter new resources in the community, or I get negative feedback from somebody who's tried to use one that's in the flyer, we do updates appropriately. But uh, this has served as a great tool for uh, taxpayers in the community to get in touch with the resources that are available. One of the more current and exciting resources that is available is uh, approximately $93 million was made available through ARPA funding for relief from COVID-related expenses and loss of wages. Um, it's the first program really available that can target property taxes. Historically, any of the resources that even I've been referring people to, they can't do a direct financial compensation for property tax program just doesn't afford it. So historically what we've been doing is, you know, financial planning. Let's free up $150 on your utility bill and you can use those funds to get caught up on property taxes, those types of things. The Help for Homeowners program is the first program that's available that does do direct property tax relief. Property taxpayers that are delinquent on the 2019, 2020, or 2021 property tax years can be eligible for relief. Um, when this was announced, there was a long lead time for it, and when it was announced, it, I was really excited about it. I actually did a media release to get word out into the community. I also went through our tax system and I identified any households that might qualify based on the age of their delinquency. We came up with a total of 1,330 taxpayer households that could potentially qualify. I put together a postcard campaign and direct mail to all 1,330 of those <coughs> households to try and get the information into their hands. Also do additional community outreach with regard to some of this type of information. Um, you know, for example, Supervisor Dembski was kind enough to allow some of this information into the library. Uh, we also reached out to other municipal offices and tried to get as much of that word out there as possible. The lead time on an application for services for this is anywhere between four and six weeks. The program pushed out about eight weeks ago, and I'm happy to report that we've already got nine taxpayers that have taken advantage of the program. We've already collected $56,000 of tax revenue through the resource of the Help for Homeowners Resources. So we're continuing to monitor that. I, I'm hopeful that this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg and that we've got additional applications that are in the works and coming through the pipeline and that we'll be able to tap into this resource even more. Uh, but I am monitoring it and tracking households that have received resources and do fully anticipate that maybe another three weeks or a month down the road here, we'll do another push and do another media campaign as well as potentially another postcard campaign. Um, another resource that's available is the Here to Help. Uh, Here to Help is a Racine County resource, and it also was one that was developed with the uh, COVID relief and intentions of COVID relief. They've been extremely helpful with regard to a lot of the taxpayers that I've worked with that are falling on hard times getting them in touch with services. Um, so that's another one that I refer out regularly. I did bring some additional flyers and have some extras up here if anybody would be interested in grabbing some on the way out. Otherwise, uh, I'm happy to email PDFs over and we can distribute those. I'm eager and excited to have other people help in the distribution of that information. You know, certainly my office is doing what we can, but the more people we have you know, talking about it, the better chances we are going to get constituents. Uh, sorry, just a quick question. When you did the media push and you reached out to the different municipalities, how was the feedback from, say, Burlington or Waterford, Northfield, whatever? Yeah, overall, I mean, it's very positive. Um, you know, the county treasurer's office is the only treasurer's office that's responsible for the collection of delinquent property taxes. Sure. The municipal offices will collect through the first installment and then they basically hand that off to the county. So they don't have a lot of experience in necessarily dealing with delinquent property taxpayers, um, but we've got a great rapport with all of our municipal offices, and you know I basically shared the information with them and asked that they you know put that on the whole bulletin board in the you know, municipal campus or whatever. So we got really good feedback on that. Oh, thanks, sir. A quick question. Yes. Um, with the push, you said there was about 
1,300 pieces of information that it went out to different families. And I'm, am I hearing you correct? Out of those, thir out of that 13, nine, nine families of the 13 have as of right now, correct, yes. Okay. But again, I mean, I, I'm optimistic that we're just really at the tip of the iceberg because honestly, those nine applications that have come in and processed through, they really exhausted that timeline required for the processing. So the, the process, yeah, this is correct, in six weeks. Um, you know, one of the great things that the Help for Homeowners program does is it's not just a finance, one-time financial relief. They go through a full interview process with the potential applicants and they look through financial budgeting and they do financial education. So it is a more extensive application process than just simply you know, putting in an application and saying, I need the money. Um, and so with that six week lead time on those applications, really I'm optimistic we're just starting to get the first of those coming through. So yeah, I know nine out of 1,300 is Less very significant, yeah. but again, you know, we're, just at the cusp of hopefully getting additional ones that are coming in. Is there a goal? I mean, yeah, from 93 so, million. So 93 million is yeah. the total set aside for the program. Right. They uh, allocate 10% of that toward administrative costs and then 5% of that toward um, legal aid. So approximately 80 million will be distributed by way of funds. The 80 million certainly is available for property tax relief, but it's also available for things like mortgage payments, delinquent mortgage payments. It's available for delinquent utility bills and household expenses like that. So, um, you know, we've got and it's a statewide program. So we have 72 counties in the state of Wisconsin. You know, me doing my simple math, my we're seeing county share is 1.2 million, right? I mean, if we get 1.2 million, then we're getting our share of that pool. Uh, my goal is to obviously exceed that. Now, I don't anticipate exceeding that simple, simply and exclusively in property tax relief because again, mortgage lenders are going to be tapping into that resource as well as utilities and those types of things. So it'll be very difficult to quantify specifically how much of those resources went to Racine County specifically. Um, however, we do have a direct pipeline to the Department of Administration, and that is one of the things that we work with them on is trying to track that information as much as possible so that we can gauge that. So my goal from the treasurer's office is to hopefully get $500,000 worth of tax relief for the Racine County constituents. Um, you know, I think that that's ambitious and optimistic, but it's also doable if we continue to push hard. Is there an end date? There's not, it's a first come first served okay. type of situation. Uh, last I checked was about a week and a half ago, they had about 30 million of that 80 million that was allocated through applications. It wasn't all awarded at this point, but if those applications are all approved, then 30, we would have approximately 50 million of that 80 million left. Um, and they expect about a 10% washout rate. So we're probably about 25 million of that committed My goal is to, again, spread the word and get another push out shortly if you know, we haven't gotten a substantial push from the original push out. I'm sorry. Yeah, please. I was gonna say, so how, I guess, how user friendly is it, like in terms of the mailers that you did? I guess I'm just trying to look at, really try to capitalize on this program to really connect with people that really need it. So yeah. that's what I guess I'm trying to figure out is, if there was only nine, let's say, out of the 1,300, was, was it a, and this is not a knock on you at all. Is this, is it, do they just not comprehend what, how extensive the program is and how beneficial it could be for them or? That may be part of it. And you know, one of the reasons, the main reason that I went with a postcard as opposed to a standard direct mail is because I was concerned that someone gets something from the treasurer's office and maybe it doesn't even get opened and it just sure. right into recycling. Yeah. So, you know, I did spend the money to go with the postcard so it was right there in your face and you really, had to avoid it not to see it sure um, but it, it is difficult to gauge uh, you know again I I do feel that we're just at the beginning stages of some of that revenue starting to come in and sure. some of those resources yeah. um, the process is user-friendly so 
We had a QR code created for the postcard mailer, so it's a matter of just scanning the QR code and it takes you directly to the online application process. Um, if it's if a constituent is not tech savvy, then they would have to call in uh, to a resource number, but it's a 1 800 number. Yep. And then um, you know, those applications are processed. We're promoting the program, but we don't have any engagement in the process of the application. So those applications are processed by the same Kenosha Community Action Coalition. Okay. And um, so some of that time lag also is a result of you know, limited resources in that type of a situation. If they've got 500 applicants that are coming in, they only have so many resources to process. Sure. But I am confident that it's user friendly, um, but it is dependent on you know the receiver of the information that physically received the information. I sure. reached out to a friend of mine, a personal friend of mine, that I knew that was behind on his property taxes. He didn't. He didn't recall receiving the postcard. So, you know, it does require that recipient to physically receive the information and then take action. Sure. Um, you know, one of the other things that I am doing, we track system notes. So anytime we have communication with the taxpayer, we get notes into our system so that we can look back years from now and track that information. So of those 1,300 papers <coughs> that went out, we're in the process of going and sifting through all of our system notes to see if we can get a phone number. Yeah. We've got a phone number we're doing or email. Right. Or email. Right. And we're doing direct outreach to constituents that you know we haven't seen applications come in on. Sure. But again, just trying to reinforce the program and get it out there. So um, you know, we do have limited resources. So we're working through that and I'm short staffed right now, so it's you know we're working through it, but I do anticipate within the next couple of weeks we'll get through that entire list and we'll just sift it through and we'll have good contact information for everybody. I've already personally made phone calls to constituents that I think could benefit from it and you know, encourage them to reach out and make applications. Thank I, you. Have, I do have a question and then I see some hands. So um, and maybe this is a little bit too much of a demand on your department, but uh, I I think because uh, as representatives, we are out in the community. It, it'd be fantastic. So let me just throw the dream out there. But it'd be fantastic if we drew a list of the individuals within our district that we could personally reach out to. Yeah, sure. um, not to say that your system divides it into or can categorize which district. We just redistricted, so if it did. But I don't know the connection you have with the GIS system that uh, we have. If you do, they already map out where our districts are. Um, I can just see the weight on your face, like, oh my gosh, what do I have to do here? But I wanted to throw that out there because maybe there is some possibility. I don't know if those addresses are somehow connected uh, because all homeowners and are, of course, through our GIS, but those that are delinquent, yeah. Sure. No, no and I appreciate that. And I mean, yeah. I absolutely welcome any cooperation and outreach type of effort. Yeah. Um, there is no clean cut easy way to do that. The easiest way or the cleanest way is the, the parcel numbers for properties are somewhat sequential. So, you know, if we're looking at District 1, for example, many of those parcel numbers are going to be in sequence one after the other. So we'll be able to probably, I mean, I would say that we'd be able to narrow down kind of quads, if sure. you will, and say, you know, these, this group of 250 parcel numbers kind of fit into your district. <laughs> um, but to, I don't know that we've got the, honestly, the return on investment to spend the time that would be necessary to be so specific to only be able to provide in-district lists. Um, I will reach out to Kim Christman. Chris, Kim Christman, you know, works down at land records and she may have some sort of a workaround that I'm not familiar with that may simplify the process to the GIS. So we'll certainly tap in. We do have multiple layers that. within that system, so it is fantastic, but maybe I'll put it then on uh, the backs of those supervisors who would like to do that to look to see if we can kind of get those quad areas um, instead of you saying to you, hey, send a list out to uh, supervisors areas that might be in their district so if supervisors do have time to do that and want to get out of their district maybe connecting with you and but I have a feeling
feeling there probably is a way with those layered systems that we currently have. Well, you're so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I saw hands up. I'm just because you're next to me. I saw you, but okay. I think uh, uh, Supervisor Trottier also had it. Hand up as well. So please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, said what I was oh. going to say, <laughs> Jeff, but uh, just to just to add to it, I would say, uh, you know, with the uh, unclaimed funds list, which maybe we'll talk a little bit about before the day is up, uh, but that is a list that I'll go through, and, you know, I won't, so for anyone who doesn't know this unclaimed funds list, you know, it's just people that we actually have money to, uh, the, the county has money belongs to them for whatever reason, uh, but it just hasn't, hasn't gotten to them uh, and, and it's still with us. So it may say Nick Nemsky has $150 at the county and all I actually have to do is like go show up and be like, hey, can I get in? So it's a great you know, thing to be able to, uh, you know, because the addresses are associated on that list, I don't have to know these people if I know if this person lives in my district, I can just knock on their door and say, hey, the county has $500 of yours. <laughs> like, uh, you're welcome, have a great day. And that's, a, that's a very good way to start a relationship. Right? Um, so I think we would be, that's all just to say, I think we probably would be motivated at least a little bit to, to try to help them, especially if you're just wanting help with distribution and getting the word out. So even if uh, you're not able to figure out a way to cross and splice the list into our districts, you know, if it's 13, 30 names and the addresses are associated with it, then you're just giving us the list to go through ourselves. Yeah, so and have yeah, more than receptive to doing that. I'll get that list pushed out right away and then I'll make efforts to see if we can break that down in the districts. Are you talking? I'm sorry. Are you talking about the property tax relief for to to, to, to narrow that list down to identify the 1,300 postcards yeah. that we sent out? So that list of people that we sent those postcards out to. So I guess if if that were to happen, then the list were being derived from supervisors. What would that look like from a supervisory standpoint to reach out to those people? Because if I were to, let's say, if any one of us were to show up at someone's door and go, we understand you're behind on property taxes, mm -hmm. that seems a little intrusive. I'm not knocking it, because I think, I, your heart's in the right place, I get it. But I just think that maybe some people might think that might be a little bit intrusive. Like, well, how do you know that? Mm -hmm. I think, well, just because it is county has been trying to collect taxes, they know sure. that they are delinquent, and sure. a lot of us have formed a relationship. Yeah. And so it's a trusting, if I got a postcard that looks similar to that in the mail, it looks like the other junk mail that comes, it just goes sure. right into my recycle bin. Yeah. And I'm sure that's probably what sure. has happened. And so, you know, saying that, I know you probably received this, I don't want to let you know it's not some type of scam. Sure. Yeah. And uh, please read through it if you have some questions, I'm here for you. Sure. And so that's how I saw that. Sure. I know um, what Nick was talking about, the unclaimed funds list, is a little bit different. That I think would be easier. Yes, right, for sure. Hey, sure. You know, but that's yeah. how I envision myself. And sure. just maybe because I've been around a, lot, a while, I may sure. know yeah. the, um, the area and the people. But so I just saw it as a way to build trust and to let them know that, that we truly are trying to help and it's not some scam. I'm sorry, I do appreciate that yeah. position. I mean, it is sensitive information. If yeah. nothing else, talking about somebody's finances. Um, rest assured, it's a matter of public information. So yeah. anything that I'm providing you by way of names and delinquents and amounts, that type of thing, it's all obtainable on the county website. So yeah. there's no violation there. Um, and then, you know, in my mind, the good offsets the bad in that situation. You know, I was on the phone with a taxpayer yesterday who qualified for and is going to be awarded, and she was literally in tears because she had this burden weighing over her that yeah. she didn't know how to deal with and didn't have a solution for, and right. you know, somebody presented them a solution. So, you know, in that regard, I think that the good outweighs the bad. Sure, and I just want to clarify, I'm not... No, no, I, I think, 
Yeah. Yeah. Great. Any type of resources to be able yeah. to get families to know about this that'll produce a better than less than one percent return on information. I mean, it's something like point zero zero six seven percent return nine of thirteen hundred. So any type of additional ways in which we can communicate <coughs> to racing residents about money that could benefit them and they enjoy it and cry, yep. you know, good <laughs> tears is good. I think Mr. Supervisor yes. tried it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Please. You all covered a lot that I wanted to ask, so uh, thank you very much. But I just, a couple of things came to mind. Um, I hate to keep beating down the 1,309, <laughs> but uh, the way- uh, I always hesitate, hesitate to even put the numbers out there. No, 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 I don't no, 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 I, I, I'm glad. I'm glad, Jeff, that, that, that you did provide us the numbers. I just, so I understand that Racine County, Racine Kenosha Com Community Action does all the counseling, correct? Correct. So the processes, you apply for it, and that gets funneled to Racine Kenosha County Community Action. Right. Um, I would be curious to find out how many applications are funneled through that system then to make the nine look like maybe 50 people tried to obtain that number. Sure. Okay, and we only got nine results. Now we're talking 50 responses actually in front of people rather than nine. Sure. Nine successes, we know that. But how many people are attempting to do this? And, uh, you know, like you said, they may be overworked. So that'd be something I would be interested in, which would met a portion of that would measure the success of the program at its infancy, infancy stages. Absolutely. And I will let you know, because I do serve on that board, oh. that they are actually quite inundated with applications. But it is a very extensive process that they must yeah. go through. So, and that's probably why they have those six weeks. So, and again, all nine of those literally came in within the last week. So, yeah. oh, I'm 100% well. confident well. that it's just the beginning of what we're going to receive. But uh, again, I mean, and I'm, I certainly would never ask that you're going door to door and handing out this information. But if I can help leverage relationships that you already have with your constituents, that's, I guess, what I would do. Okay, I know you have so many much more <laughs> to go over, so bit. please, I'll we get stuck. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, though. Uh, so, you know, property taxes is one of the biggest things that we do, and, you know, I really I take an approach from the beginning of cooperation and education. So, my door is always open, I'm meeting with constituents, we're doing financial planning, we're, you know, talking through various options, those types of things. And once we've exhausted that, we kind of get into some of the more aggressive type of things. Um, I incorporated structured payment plans when I took over office, and the next slide I'll kind of show you some of the results of those. I <coughs> taxpayers with financial resources and education. Uh, you know, I've done out outreach with local realtors and local mortgage lenders. Uh, mortgage lenders can save constituents considerable money on interest and penalties by refinancing that debt as opposed to gain the government 18% annual interest and penalty charges on that. Um, and then, you know, if we've exhausted all of those options and the, the constituent just outright is not receptive or cooperative, then we take some more punitive type of actions. Uh, you know, we do have the ability to place debts with the uh, state of Wisconsin and their tax intercept program. So that is a tool that we use to potentially recover property taxes that are delinquent. And then just this last year, we started to use the state of Wisconsin's um, state debt collection process as well. So they can not only intercept taxes, but they can also seize assets and accounts, those types of things. <clears throat> so that's really a last resort, but it's just to really demonstrate that we're exhausting all options when it comes to collecting property taxes. You know, on, the front end of that, when we're talking about that education and cooperation, this is a success story that we had early on. A household was in our foreclosure action in 2020. They had $86,000 in delinquent property taxes and went back about eight years. Working with them, I was able to get them in touch with a mortgage lender that was able to refinance their debt. They have now completely paid their property taxes in full. 
they no longer have that 18% interest, they are in a you know, standard refinance, five to 6% interest loan. They're saving approximately $325 per month just in interest and penalty charges by restructuring that debt. So again, this is the these are the options that we really look to exhaust first and foremost is to put the tools in the hands of the taxpayer to explore those options. The structured payment agreements, um, we currently have 245 active payment agreements and those active payment agreements generate $177,000 per month in tax revenue that we're collecting. These are taxpayers that oftentimes would have otherwise been overwhelmed by the debt. You know, if you fall two or three years behind, it's difficult to decide how am I gonna come up with $10,000 to pay my delinquent property taxes and rather than Figuring out a solution, oftentimes, unfortunately, people just kind of ignore the problem and it gets worse. So, uh, you know, the standardized uh, repayment agreements, it's a tool that we use to really kind of put them in a position of being successful. Uh, I look to have uh, repayment, if someone has a year of delinquency, I look for a six month repayment schedule on that. So if, they, if they've fallen behind four years on property taxes, we're getting them caught back up in two years. And we're accounting for that future interest and penalty charge so that when they get to the end of that two year repayment schedule, they're completely current. Um, so again, we've got you know regular consistent monthly revenue coming in off of those payment agreements. We've got 205 already that have paid in full. So they've gone through the entire repayment schedule and they're completely current. So we've got another 245 that are active. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, what is the um, legal requirement? What can the county do and how delinquent do I have to be on my residential property taxes before you can act and take my property? Is it 36 months? Yeah, so technically. There's, there's no distinction between residential or commercial. It's just, you know, property taxes. September 1st of each year, we issue a tax certificate for delinquent balance. So if you're scheduled to pay your property taxes this year, September 1st comes and you still have a tax balance outstanding, we issue a certificate against that balance. If that certificate becomes two years old, then it becomes foreclosable. So, you know, yeah, Supervisor Charter, you're, you're saying 36 months, that really is what it is. If somebody's three years delinquent, right. that's really the time frame that they become foreclosable. Um, so that's kind of the most aggressive. And, and I just asked the question, not that I want the properties, but there are people out there that, you know, it's like, come on, pay your taxes. Um, yeah, yes, just me personally, I know of people. Uh, and I asked that question because there's been disputes of delinquent taxes on a property that um, individuals want Walworth County to take in a tax foreclosure. Sure. Okay, not racing County. And you know, yeah. one of the other things that I started doing is I recognized that you know that September first time frame. So um, usually around the first of the year, what we do is we start to reach out to those certificates that are going to become foreclosable in September. So you know, come September first, the 2019 property tax balance is becoming foreclosable. We already are re have reached out to anybody that has a 2019 balance outstanding. We start off with a, you know, a very open receptive approach in that, hey, we want them to be aware, nine months from now, this property is going to become foreclosable unless this is addressed. And then we have a follow-up letter that goes out and a follow-up letter that goes out to that. And they get increasingly more aggressive, but um, you know, I, I genuinely feel like we're doing absolutely everything we can to educate that taxpayer before they reach that point of being in a situation where they're at risk of losing their property. So um, last year was the first year that we did that and we had great success with that and we're doing it again this year and we're going to continue to do that. So um, yeah, we try to avoid the foreclosure at all costs, uh, but sometimes it is necessary. Thank you. Absolutely. Speaking of foreclosure, um, you know, when I took office, we had 1,500 parcels in Racine County that were foreclosable by meeting the definition of that third year of delinquency. We're down to 407 now. So in two years, we've you know, taken 1,100 of those foreclosable parcels off of uh, 
um, that list. It's really a multi-pronged approach. Um, you know, many of them are, some of them are the refinance type of situation. Some of them are protected by those repayment agreements that they're honoring. But um, you know, we're gonna continue to make those strides to where we have a manageable inventory and um, you know, we can really work with those taxpayers on a more one-on-one -on -one basis hopefully 200 yeah, a year from now. If a property is foreclosed on, then we go through the process of preparing it for sale and then recovering that delinquent property tax and interest and penalty balance. So since I've taken office, we've had 78 parcels that we've sold for a total of 1.73 million, 1.73 million in recovered interest and penalty. Um, and then you know, putting those parcels back onto the tax roll. We also actively work with uh, Habitat for Humanity and other organizations to look at potential improvements that they can be making through donation. We've recently donated two more parcels to Habitat for Humanity over on Mead Street that they're <coughs> going to be rehabbing. Uh, they are a great resource in taking that vacant city lot, putting new construction on it, and improving the community overall. I, I come from a sales background. I do have a, sale, a real estate sales license and a licensed realtor. So I quickly recognized that there was a lot of opportunity here. Um, we have incorporated tools to solicit prospective buyers and investors in these properties. <coughs> and I'm happy to say that right now we have over 475 unique buyers that when we do have a sale approaching, we do active outreach to those buyers to inform them of what the inventory is going to look like and when a sale is and all the details uh, to promote competitive and multiple bids, hoping to you know, increase the sales prices of that. Uh, we also require that they're responsible buyers. So when I do put a property up for sale, nobody's eligible to purchase that property if they have delinquent property taxes in the same county. They're also not eligible to purchase that property if they have any outstanding work orders, health and safety issues with any of the municipal enforcement areas. So, um, you know, we are working to really, you know, not only just turn these around and give them back to somebody that's going to fall delinquent on property taxes and repeat the cycle, we're working to put these back in the hands of responsible property owners that are going to improve the community. Overall property tax collection, um, you know, this is just a chart that kind of shows what we've been doing over the course of the last three years. In total, uh, we've increased total property collection, total property tax collections in 20, from 2019 to 2021 by about $11 million. So, um, you know, it's, we're making significant progress. It's multiple facets that go into that. It's the revenue from the sales. It's the revenue from the you know, $2 million a year that we have in the property tax, the repayment agreements. It's all of those different pieces coming together, but we're continuing to make strides in growing that revenue source. And that's it. Any additional questions? Committee. Uh, the only thing I'll, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I'll note uh, for the county supervisors uh, that are new is that we, if you recall, I think it was on our last uh, communication as a county board, a list of bankruptcies and items that you will see. I don't know if I've ever seen an agenda without them. Is that accurate? Maybe that have come. And so we had asked uh, Jeff when he came before us again, what do we do with those? And it was, uh, the answer was, it, it's probably too late at that point because we do see the names of the individuals that are going through it. It is too late at that point. Um, you did provide us at the time uh, a list prior to coming before the county board because um, once we see it, if we see a constituent's name that we might know, it's like, oh man, it hurts the heart, especially mm -hmm. knowing it's too late at that point and we possibly would have been able to reach out and make a um, we have not put on you to ask for that to be sent to us uh, frequently. It was just that one time. 
uh, my ask to you, uh, how can we be better? How can we, how can we do better to help you and to help our constituents in uh, those particular communications that come before Sure. Well, rest assured, it is my intention to continue to share that list. Okay. So the list that Supervisor Trevelyan is referring to is when we initiate a foreclosure action, we had this last one, we had a list of 162 properties that we were going to initiate action on. Um, the supervisor Trevelyan requested a copy of that list, and thank you for doing that. I, again, welcome as much cooperation as possible. Um, I have every intention of continuing to do that. Our foreclosure actions, honestly, are taking place once a year. So that list will, will probably have another one that I'm going to distribute in September type of time frame, October type time frame of this year. And I would welcome and encourage any cooperation that you know I can get. But I think the biggest thing really is just you know being receptive and being receptive to leveraging those existing relationships that you might have with constituents. So you know even as we go through that foreclosure process. I do absolutely everything I can to avoid that court date. You know, we exhaust all options. Um, I reach out when appropriate. So, uh, you know, for example, this most recent foreclosure action, um, there was a household in Supervisor Smetana's district that I just, I had relentlessly been trying to get in contact with. They were literally only that third year behind they had a lot of equity in the home. They were not a constituent that was necessarily defaulting on their responsibility. Um, I reached out to Supervisor Smetana and he did know that constituent, he knocked on the door and he opened up that dialogue and we were able to find a solution. So I really think that that's probably the biggest benefit that you can serve if you're looking yeah. to assist me in my efforts is opening up that dialogue. Supervisor Dempsey's been in my office with constituents that have been in a situation, just being able to, again, like leverage that relationship instead of me being an evil tax collector. You know, you have that relationship and you can, you know, Jeff's not that bad a guy. Sit down, <laughs> sit down and talk with them. You've done a lot of great things and, and uh, made it possible for us all to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I can request that uh, if we can maybe uh, make this process a little more official, if we could maybe have that list come to MT and that this board get delivered that list in September, October, and then that way we can encourage the other supervisors on the county board to review it. I mean, it can be dispersed to all the, all the county board, but if we can make that official and it's something that comes before this committee in October or September, is that okay? And I say this out loud, and I'll put a reminder on my phone, but I'm looking to you too, to also help you know, during that time. Stuff, I know you're busy, you're busy, we're busy, and it's a good idea right now, so hopefully we can continue with that. Um, your hand was up. Okay, Supervisor Dempsey. Thank you, Chair. I, just to follow up with what Jeff said, uh, I have a lot of, you know, a lot, we have very wealthy people in my district who own lakefront property, and we have people in grinding poverty in my district uh, who are struggling with a lot of the issues that Jeff deals with every day. Um, but a lot of my people are very skeptical and very resistant, and, and Jeff is just so excellent in his role. Uh, just a very gentle uh, person who's willing to hold, hold the hands of families who are going through difficult things like this and uh, find, find solutions find a better outcome for them. So thank you for doing that. I was just going to ask, um, sort of a, a, again, going back to the unclaimed funds list. So I realized that a lot of the time, so uh, there's there's basically two, two sorts of people that I reach out to uh, regarding this list. One is if I look through a list and I just know the person, and I'll maybe just rip off a text to them or something. The other one is, like I said, someone who lives in my district that I don't know, just want to call or knock on the door. Um, but very often I'm like, yeah, well, it could, you know, they're like, why does the county have money of mine? And I'm like, well, it could be this or that or this. Have you done this? You know, did this happen in the last year? And sometimes they're just like, 
no, none of that. And I'm just like, well, I have no idea, but we have some new money. So I'm just curious if you could maybe give me some, some insight, some better talking points um, to give them some context for why that might be. Sure. Some things that I'm missing. It, it is difficult even for us to often kind of quantify exactly what that is. The biggest feeder of that unclaimed fund pool is the clerk of circuit court. So oftentimes what those funds are generated from is perhaps um, somebody was awarded or somebody was ordered to pay restitution. The restitution was paid to the court, but then the court was unable to find a recipient to track down the recipient of those funds. So they made an attempt to mail to the last known address. If those funds come back or if the check goes on cash, then it basically, they, that's when it falls into the unclaimed fund pool. Um, you know, again, the largest contributor is the clerk of circuit court. So a lot of times it's that type of a situation. Sometimes it may be a, a situation where uh, you know, they had paid a fee or a fine that, you know, once the, judgment of their charge was decided they were no longer responsible for that and it was looking to be returned. Um, I will sit through and try and see if we can really try and quantify that, but honestly, even as people come into our office to make the claim for those unclaimed funds, oftentimes our office really only has a case number that we can reference. Um, I will commend you, I know firsthand at least three people have been in in the last couple of weeks to make unclaimed fund claims per your recommendation, so um, appreciate that. But yeah, essentially, if funds are either in the municipal level or the clerk of courts or finance department, essentially if a check gets sent out and doesn't get cash, uh, those funds kind of go into a pool of unclaimed funds. My office is responsible for promoting the unclaimed funds. We're, we're statutorily required to um, you know, publish that in the newspaper. We also do outreach efforts by direct mail campaigns. We have some systems where we're able to potentially get other addresses that weren't available or provided to the clerk of circuit courts. So we do direct outreach with those as well and mail to other addresses as well. If the unclaimed funds go unclaimed for a 10 year period of time, then they essentially get absorbed by the county. So, you know, we do have a pool of funds that we're regularly trying to distribute and get back out into the people that are entitled to them. But oftentimes it's challenging that, you know, it's sometimes unfortunately it's a slightly transient population. They don't necessarily stay in the same house for 10 years or five years, you know, so they, if they're moving around frequently, it may be difficult to track them down. I'll see what I can do to get some more talking points for you to kind of highlight maybe the top four or five things that most of them are for. Um, and, but yeah, again, we struggle with the same thing with people coming in and go about $500, what's this for? Well, in reference to this case number, <coughs> And oftentimes it's as detailed as we can get with it. May I just add, <coughs> put that one to bed? Do you know, is it, would it sometimes potentially be mailed? Like someone could fail, the case gets resolved? Potentially, yep. Okay, okay, great, thank you. So do you have, sorry, do you have any, like a little flyer that you have? So I know you have flyers for like some of these other things. Do you have a flyer for the unclaimed funds? I'm looking at the website, I mean, it's pretty easy to navigate and access. But I mean, just something that, be shared, let's say, on the county social media? Sure, I don't presently, and that's a great idea. So we do certainly, we publish the unclaimed funds reports in the newspaper. We also do our own individual outreach, as well as you can see, we post the full list on our county website, yeah. but people need to go look for it. Right? Sure. Um, yeah, we can certainly put together a flyer that could be. Because I think it, something like that could be easier to share with just like the in a flyer form, simple, that can be shared with, like, the buy, sell, trade groups, you know, on social media. I mean, that's where I, I share most of, like, the stuff that I try to communicate out to people. That it, especially, I, mean, just, I think more people see things like that than they would, let's say, a postcard from the county. And that's, again, that's not a knocking, but I just think that for as many buy, sell, trade groups that are out there, or news and information groups that are out there, something like a, a generic flyer like that saying if you 
deal with too much being fun. It's kind of like the, the, the here to help or the home deal. That was that flyer was fantastic. So. Using governance representatives, did you have a question? I did have a question, but it was answered. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> awesome. How about you? Uh, did I miss anything when I was gone? <laughs> no, you didn't. It was just the start of the meeting, and uh, Jeff really started this up. So, okay. Thanks for asking. Any other committee members before we allow Jeff to go? No, are we good? All right. Thank, Thank you. you for being Thank present. You. Thank you. All right, we just have a couple more items that are before us. And uh, I, I don't, I'm going a little bit out of order, but I just wanted to say at the end of this meeting, if we could just stick around for a second, we're gonna have a picture taken. And Jeff, the couple items that we have really are gonna take a couple seconds. Could you be our photographer? Oh, sure. Oh, I'm gonna have MT part of the picture too. <laughs> okay, oh, sorry, thank you so much. Okay, the next agenda item that we have is report number 2022-3, uh, report by the county executive making a reappointment to the local emergency planning committee. And this is, if you would see attached, it would be for Bob Miller. Um, this is an actionable item, so this is one we would need a motion. Okay, it's been motioned and seconded. Um, Supervisor Maldonado, motion. And then second. All right, very good. Any discussion? Hearing none, youth and governance representatives, how do you wish to vote? Aye for, yeah, no for no. Aye, how do you wish to vote? Aye. I'm asking, um, right now we are, um, the county executive is wanting to appoint somebody to the emergency planning committee. So we, we have to vote on this item to say whether we agree with it. Okay, so do you wish to vote? Yes. Perfect, okay. <laughs> Committee, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any nays? All right, hearing none, it passes. Report number 2022-4. Report by the county executive making an appointment to the Waterford Public Library of Trustees. I see that we have Peters, Shannon Peters. Um, this is an actionable item, so I will need a motion. Okay, Supervisor Jeff. Demski, then Supervisor Maldonado for the second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All youth and governance representatives, how do you wish to vote? Ah. Perfect. Okay. Committee members, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Passes. Report number 2022 6, report by the county executive making a reappointment to the Racine Public Library Board of Trustees. And this is for Melvin Hargrove. This is an actionable item, a motion. Move to approve, Madam yep. Chair. All right, Supervisor Trotty, you're in seconded. Thank you kindly. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, youth and governance representatives, how do you wish to vote? Oh, I'm sorry. This is, yeah, um, again, this is an appoint, uh, appointment, a reappointment already serving on the Racine Public Library Board and they want to extend his time serving. Yeah. Oh, I, perfect. <laughs> all right. And uh, for the committee, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any nays? Hearing none, it passes. All right, these next items, we can go ahead and make a motion together. I'm going to go ahead and read them and then just describe what this is just for the new members. So these are referrals that have come from other municipalities and resolutions that are brought before their municipality. If this is something when you read through, please read through your packet, and if it's something that you feel fits Racine County, this is something we would pull out, but we would have to go through corporate counsel and we would have to work it to match what would happen at our committee, or at, in our county. So um, normally these are for DG and files. So I will go ahead and read them, but then I will ask motion for all three of us, uh, somebody on this committee would like them separated. Resolution 2021-1, Jefferson County, requesting the state of Wisconsin to revise the current real estate transfer fee revenue sharing formula. Uh, letter B, Resolution 03-2201 from Moreau County on Clean Water. Letter C, Resolution 4512-21, La Crosse, regarding the advisory referendum an actionable item a motion please all right discussion madam chair yes um 
Discussion on resolution 2022-11 in regards yeah. to the uh, uh, county changing the Wisconsin transfer tax fee. Is everybody familiar? I just want to bring this to everybody's attention. What that specifically is and it's referring to. Please. Okay. Um, just and, and it, I'm going to expound on this a moment because I've done some research on this and I'm really thinking seriously about providing a resolution so that would be more income to the county. Um, in paragraph number one uh, of this resolution from the county, uh, you know, it, it states just a general statement. Um, in paragraph number two, it says, in 1981, the state arbitrarily changed the, the transfer fee formula to now require counties to take 80% of all transfer fees collected, okay? Your Wisconsin real estate transfer tax fee is paid on every single sale of real estate in the county. Example, on a $100,000 house, you're paying $300, 0.003% of that sales price. The seller pays it. 80% of that money goes to the state, 20% goes to the county. It used to be prior to that change of law that the counties would get 80% and, this, and, and the state would get 20%. But a note, just note this, in 81, that Wisconsin real estate transfer tax fee was changed, it was 0.001% and it went to 003 So the state said, well, you're getting more now because we're collecting, so be happy with the 50-50. Okay, so what we need to do and we need to consider that should this come out of this committee or should it be done by an individual supervisor, it's gonna take, and I, again, I've done some research, I've made some calls around, it's gonna take a lot of counties to request this to be done and it's gonna take Wisconsin Counties Association to put it on their agenda to make it a resolution across the state. So let's think of doing this because if in fact we did it as a county request, as a resolution, we have to have that passed before we have the conference in September when they take up the new resolutions. So it's an action item that we should act on if we want to in the next 30, no more than 60 days and possibly if we get a good portion of the counties to back this and WCA to back this, maybe we can get the laws changed. <laughs> maybe, okay? <laughs> but, but it would be a good source of income and a, a point of, uh, of contention from the counties association to receive more of the three and a half to four billion dollar reserve that the state currently has in their coffer. Okay, so thank you for letting no. me explain that question. How yeah. many counties would it take? Um, you know, I, I, I talked to Carrie Hope, I think her last name is, and she said, you're gonna have to get at least three quarters of the counties to do this, and you're gonna have to get uh, WCA to do this. And I don't have a number of how many counties have presented this at the current time. So if we don't get it done now, maybe we can get it done in September of 2023. But something we need to think about, more revenue for Racine County. Thank you very much, Madam. No, Chair. you're welcome. And uh, this, uh, thank you for bringing that up. So it gives a really good example to uh, the new members and uh, exactly what these resolutions are meant to do. They're trying to build support to um, change what's going on at the state level. So oftentimes what happens is we read this language granted uh, there is some very specific language to Jefferson County but uh, you know if it's as simple as throwing in Racine finding out our numbers this right. could easily be a resolution Absolutely. that could come before this committee and uh, be sponsored by this committee and uh, then sent off to the state so maybe we'll be seeing Racine for the next month <laughs> so, <laughs> so very good I um, do recognize that Super Mal uh, Supervisor Maldonado did make a motion to receive and file these items. I did not hear a second, I apologize. So Supervisor Dembski, thank you. Uh, any further discussion on receiving and file? I do have a question about the resolution on yes. clean water. So what, 